Morning, James. Good morning, Mike. How are you? I'm very good. And uh, Carmen from Oshki Ogamog School in Grand Portage is also with me. Oh, great. Hi, Carmen. Good morning. Glad you could join us. <coughs> and morning, I see Jen Sorensen. Oops, sorry. Yep, good morning. Hey, Jen, how are you? Good. Good morning, John. Good morning. Sorry about that. I just came out of another meeting. <laughs> as did I, as <laughs> did probably several of us. Yeah. Good morning, all. Good morning. Hey there, Kate. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Morning, everyone. All right. Just to let everyone know, we are now live streaming. So this video can be viewed um, later if other participants are not able to make it. Very good. Thanks, April. We'll wait another minute or two for others to, to log on. We, uh, we weren't able to find a time that everyone could meet. Um, so we've got this, this meeting occurring today and then we've got a second one scheduled on Friday. Both of which will be recorded and put on the county's website, by the way. Good morning, Ellison and Grace. Good morning. Good morning. And Sheriff Eliason. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> I'm going to, uh, before we go any further, my allergy symptoms have been um, in, in full effect over the last few weeks. And so I do have a little bit of um, congestion that's causing me to cough periodically. I'm gonna try to keep that to a minimum, but it's not always completely controllable. So good morning, Dan. Hello, sorry, I'm a minute late here. It's all right. We're, we're just now getting started, so it's all good. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and, and start the, uh, the conversation. And um, again, other people may join on, but uh, I just wanted to um, have us all have the opportunity to, to have a conversation about the American Rescue Plan funds that the county is receiving. Um, the uh, Funds are for, well, the amount that we're receiving um, is just a little bit north of a million dollars. It's like a million sixty one thousand one hundred and twenty four dollars. Um, these funds were um, were allocated by Congress back in March. Um, and we have until the end of uh 2024 to program them and they have to be fully expended by the end, or I'm sorry, is that 23? Well, we're gonna be going over dates. So um, we'll, we'll cover that in just a minute. In any case, um, this is really a great opportunity for the county to um, invest in some, some work that, that we're doing in response to the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but also to maybe make investments in other areas to, to strengthen the community. And we'll talk about those eligible uses in just a minute. Um, I assume that we all know each other. Um, I don't know if we want to do introductions or if people are just comfortable forging ahead. I th think we all kind of know each other. Okay. All right, moving on. Okay, so um, again, uh, the county is receiving these funds. Um, they're coming through county government directly from the U.S. Treasury, um, but I, I don't see these, count, these funds as belonging to county government. They're really coming to our community, and I feel like the best way for us to determine how to spend these dollars is really to have a conversation about how the dollars can be used, what our community needs are, and the best way to apply the funding to those needs. And so that's, that's the conversation today. I'm gonna to start by doing a little overview of 
the timeline and some of the logistics involved in the use of these dollars. And then really what I want the, the bulk of this meeting to be is really just a discussion of um, what your organization's needs are and um, how you would like to see these dollars spent. Obviously, <clears throat> there are many, many stakeholders involved in this conversation. And so we can't make any promises today. This is really the start of what, what will be a um, community conversation about uh, the use of these dollars. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping that within the next month or so, we can have a pretty clear idea of what people's desires are and start uh, defining what the, what the budget will look like. And so that's kind of the gist of our, our discussion today. And before going on, I'll just see if there are any questions or uh, issues that, that you would like to make sure we address today. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands, so we'll go ahead. Um, I am going to share my screen. And so I sent you all a link to a document from the National Association of Counties, which has put together some really great resources. Um, hang on just a moment here. There we go. All right. Can you see a document that says overview for America's counties? Okay. Great. So this is this is a 26 page document that's on the National Association of Counties website. If you uh, want a copy of it, it can be downloaded there. And it's a really detailed uh, summary of what the funds are, uh, what the timeline for their expenditure is, and how it can be used. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight some some key dates. Um, so the county has secured the first half of this funding. It is being uh, distributed in, into separate portions, half of which we have already received, and the other half of which <clears throat> by law has to be distributed uh, before March 11th of next year. <clears throat> so the, um, the U.S. Treasury is currently accepting comments on the interim final rule, which is the document that describes how the dollars can be used. Um, by August 31st of this year, we have to submit our first interim report to the U.S. Treasury, which will include a dis description of our community engagement process and uh, preliminary plans for using the dollars. Um, by October 31st of this year, we have to submit a quarterly project and expenditure report. Um, and then by December 31st of 2024, the funds must be obligated. And that just means we have to have uh, a definite plan for how to use them. Um, but we don't have to actually fully expend the funds until the end of 2026. So the, the timeline for using uh, American Rescue Plan dollars is much longer than what we experienced with the CARES dollars. And that gives us an opportunity to have this conversation and to be really intentional about how we use the dollars. So I, I do wanna switch over. I've got another document which was attached to the email that I sent you. Um, and can you see the example uses of funds? Can I see a nod? Okay, so um, there are basically eight areas which are which are very broad that um, relate to how the dollars can be used. Um, public health response is is kind of at the top of the list, and even though it is now June 2021, and we've made a lot of progress in uh, getting folks vaccinated and masking requirements have been relaxed and so on. Uh, there is still work to be done, and we do have the new, even more, the new and improved, or I'm not sure we want to look at it that way, but the Delta variant, which is more contagious and apparently causes even more uh, severe symptoms of COVID than previous versions of the virus. 
it's still out in the world. And we know there are people who uh, have not been vaccinated and probably won't choose to become vaccinated. And so there is still quite a bit of work to do in terms of public health response. And so this is an area in which dollars can be spent um, for <clears throat> services related to the containment and mitigation of, of COVID-19, um, public health work um, to, to educate people um, about COVID is eligible as our behavioral health care services. And so basically it includes a whole broad range of, of public health and healthcare services. Um, another eligible use is addressing the negative economic impacts of the pandemic. And so this can include assistance to workers and families, um, supporting small businesses with loans and grants, similar to what we did with CARES dollars, and then also speeding the recovery of impacted industries and rebuilding public sector capacity by rehiring staff and replenishing unemployment insurance funds and so on. Um, a third category is replacing public sector revenue loss. Um, so to the extent that local governments have uh, seen decreased revenues related to the pandemic, this is something for which these funds could be used. Um, another, another category is premium pay for essential workers. And this goes back to uh, January of 2020 when the emergency order was first issued. Um, so providing premium pay to essential workers, um, prioritizing low and moderate income workers in key sectors, including healthcare, grocery and food services, and so on. Um, a fifth category is water and sewer infrastructure. And so this is something that um, is of particular interest to me. Um, and I'd like to have a, a conversation about this, but basically this would enable us to uh, begin putting some water and sewer infrastructure into areas of the county that don't currently have it. Um, and why this is of interest is because it could potentially be part of the solution to our housing challenges that we can talk about more in a bit. Um, so building uh, new, new infrastructure, new water and sewer uh, service lines and facilities and also um, <clears throat> using, um, using them for purposes aligned to environmental protection agency project categories for clean water and state drinking water revolving funds. A sixth category is broadband infrastructure. And I'm glad, John, that you're on the uh, call today <clears throat> because this, uh, this funding can be used for uh, expanding broadband infrastructure. As I think we all know, the county is pretty far ahead of the game compared to a lot of other rural counties in the state and across the country. Um, but there's still some things that, that need to be done. And I know that Arrowhead uh, Cooperative has, has been seeking additional funding to finish building out our network. And we can talk more about that in a little bit. Um, finally, uh, equity focused services. So uh, creating additional flexibility for uh, disadvantaged communities to address health disparities, um, invest in housing and also educational uh, services. And um, these are applicable to qualified census tracts and other disproportionately impacted areas. And then very briefly, and, and the NACO document, the 26 pager goes into a lot more detail about this, um, but I, I didn't want to get too bogged down in the, in, in the weeds about um, all of the uses of these dollars, but I just wanted to hit it at a high level and we can certainly talk in greater detail about all of these categories. Um, but there are some ineligible uses that relate to uh, changes in reduction of next net tax revenue. Um, it, those cannot be offset with, with ARP funds, um, payments into a punch, pension fund, and then there are also other restrictions. So at a very high level, that's how the dollars can be used. And so um, I've gone through that very quickly, but again, I wanted the bulk of our conversation today to be an exchange of thoughts on how Cook County could make the best use of the dollars. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Find my cursor, there we go. 
And so um, really just wanted to get reactions from the group. Um, I should ask before we go further, um, April, are you in a position to take some notes for us today? Yes. Great. Thanks for that. So um, I know that, you know, you all have been aware that we were receiving these funds. I think we've, uh, we've made that pretty clear. And, um, you know, I guess I'll, I'll start the conversation by saying that, you know, when we realized these dollars were coming through, um, I did reach out to, uh, to Jim Boyd, uh, Mary Somnus, and Pat Campanero because I had worked with the three of them on earlier iterations of business uh, relief funding. Uh, we got some funding from the state that was approved by the legislature in December, and we worked in the first months of this year to allocate those dollars um, for another round of relief funding for businesses. And that, that was very successful. Um, and then also, as you know, we, we allocated CARES dollars for business relief as well. So there have been a couple of iterations of uh, support for, for businesses. And in talking generally about how we could use these dollars, um, you know, there, there are other needs in the community, certainly, and there are ongoing uh, resources for business owners to tap into um, to address um, any hardships that they've encountered as a result of the pandemic. And so my, my initial, my personal inclination was to shy away from doing another round of business relief. Um, it's certainly not off the table, but, but again, there, there have been resources applied in that area. And I think these dollars present an opportunity for us to, to explore some other areas that really are strong community needs um, that um, we haven't been able to, to meet so far. So I will just pause there and ask the question of the group, um, what, what's on your mind as far as what you're thinking about how we could use these funds? Okay, there's no feedback. So I guess we're done. And uh, I wanna wish you all a good, oh, wait, there is a, there's a hand. Hi, John. <clears throat> Here we go. Now I'm off mute. I'll all go right. first since Great. nobody else wants to jump on board here. Um, so when this came out, obviously it's, we saw Robin was listed and, you know, for the county. And then we do know that not everybody has served in Cook County. You know, those outlying areas, we're still working on a grant process for that where there's no infrastructure whatsoever. So instead of looking at those particular areas, and we are really hopeful for that, but what we can do right now is what we were thinking about. And we're thinking about the low to moderate income people that don't currently have access to broadband. They can't afford to get it built from the curb to the house. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist currently. And what can we do? Along with the emergency broadband benefit currently, and that is due to expire after the funds have exhausted, but our, our assumptions right now and educated guesses at this point are that they're going to continue that based on the need for broadband throughout the entire nation. So I believe monies will continue to fund the emergency broadband benefits. If we were able to build houses to the low and moderate, or excuse me, houses, we were able to build broadband to those houses and, and then also apply the emergency broadband benefits, um, these people could have, and I'll just use the term free, you know, uh, internet for at least six months and possibly a year. And it may even go longer than that because the broadband benefit right now takes care of the entire cost of the monthly fee for the broadband. So if we were able to get that infra infrastructure in there, they would be sitting well. Um, our biggest hurdle right now is determining how many people though there are that don't currently have the you know, service at their homes and then what those costs would be associated with that. Um, in a round number, you know, we know that we could take care of a number of them for in that hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollar range without any problem. And that could serve anywhere from a hundred people to 150 people tentatively. We'll just throw it out there. Uh, we'd have to get a little bit more research done and, and figure out what those numbers are, you know, exactly, but thinking about that. The other side of that too is that True North Broadband, excuse me, Arrowhead Broadband um, would be, you know, willing to match funds as needed in, in order to do this, to make the monies go further. You know, we have the ability to do that. Um, Arrowhead Broadband is doing well. 
as a business. And so we could use those revenues that are currently there to help, you know, fund some of that. So, so that's where we're sitting, you know, as far as the county. Um, and we, you know, we know that in relation to this, in, in the, and I still have yet to get a chance to, to talk to Mr. Deschamps up in, on the, in the tribal community as well, but there's funds out there too for those communities and wanting to work with the entire county to ensure that everyone in the county has broadband available, if at all possible. So that's where we sit with that particular based on that. So that's Great. my two cents at this point. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you. I, I, do, I should mention too, you mentioned the, uh, the Grand Portage Band and I do know that uh, tribes are also receiving direct allocations um, through the American Rescue Plan. I don't know the details of uh, how those funds are going to be allocated. And so I don't right. know in terms of a dollar amount what Grand Portage would expect to receive, but I do know that they will be receiving dollars as well. Other thoughts, questions, ideas? Yeah. Jim. Uh, first a question and then a comment. Uh, the question is about broadband. It's, uh, I just happened to talk to somebody uh, yesterday who said that Dana McKenzie is actually working with the White House on uh, the infrastructure bill and her expertise is obviously broadband. And so um, is there a potential that the, uh, the needs that John has cited will be funded in the future by a different uh, pot? Um, and is there any way to know that? And then the second, the point I wanted to make is that I, I, I was intrigued by your initial idea that perhaps we could somehow invest this in a way that would uh, help stimulate housing, that housing is a, an underlying need here. Um, just how you do that, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure because um, it seems like we have a market failure. We have a huge need and yet no one's building any rental housing. And I know when uh, Mary and uh, the EDA teamed up with, uh, with one roof, it was very difficult. And so um, is there some way that we could identify what it is that keeps uh, the housing market from functioning the way you'd think it would um, here? And I, I know that we're not alone in, in this, but is there some, uh, if, if there's some way we could identify barriers to market um, action on, on uh, housing that could um, entice developers to come here and um, uh, invest in, in rental housing for, for workforce and things like that? Okay, th thanks for that, Jim. And so I know um, the first part of your, your comment was the question about other resources for broadband. And John, it sounded like you had some thoughts about that. I do, just really quick. And the things that they're working on at the White House have a lot to do with unserved or underserved communities. And we are no longer an unserved or underserved community uh, because of the amount of infrastructure that we have in place. So those things that they're working on up there will focus in on that. What we have here availability is a general fund, so to speak, that has no limiting factors with it other than what the county decides they want to do with it and based on the feedback from what we wanna do. So in a long way to answer that question, it's not going to be the same type of funding coming down later. It's gonna be completely different to get to those areas that are unserved or underserved. So, but I appreciate that question. And then the other thing I wanted to add, Jim, you mentioned the, the uh, <clears throat> need for multifamily housing. And, and there was just a story in the Star Tribune this morning about how a lot of apartment developers are either postponing projects that they have not yet started because of the high cost of building materials. And that those who are currently um, constructing multifamily housing are running into huge cost overruns. Uh, related to, to the high cost of construction materials. So that is really adding currently to the challenge of um, being able to fill that need. Yeah, and I, I, I do think though that that is going to be a very, very short-lived challenge. Um, the, the lumber futures have gone down precipitously in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. I think we'll see those construction costs uh, uh, even out very, very quickly. And that won't be a, you know, won't be an impediment going forward. There's something else that keeps them from building it here. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Linda, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just want to um, agree with what Jim said about housing and infrastructure, because I know I've heard from people the cost of, you know, just getting city water and sewer to a, pro to a property is very, very prohibited, prohibitive to any kind of development. So, you know, maybe that's an enticement. And I know there's lots, you know, there are city lots available on the west side of town. But I've also heard from people that have just said, you know, it costs us an arm and a leg. It was almost not even acceptable to build there. So if you're a developer and you're saying, hey, you know, we've got this opportunity and here's this big dangling carrot of infrastructure um, needs being met and paid for uh, before the housing gets placed. I mean, I feel like that's a pretty, pretty big carrot for any developer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I see your hand is up. And then Mary, I'll get to you next. Sorry, I didn't want to switch subjects on you there, James, but uh, right. uh, my, my question is uh, the emergency management department and many departments throughout the county during the pandemic have incurred uh, many costs, uh, some of which we submitted to FEMA for reimbursement. At, you know, today, we don't know if, if everything will be reimbursed or not, but I guess my question is, could this funding be used to reimburse anything that FEMA does not cover costs for? <clears throat> um, I think the answer is potentially. I, I couldn't say definitively right now, but um, you know, the funds can be used for retroactive expenses, uh, costs that were incurred since the emergency order uh, was, was first established in January of last year. So um, there, there might be an opportunity to do that. Mary? Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'm all about housing. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate your interest in discussing this concept, James. Um, I can tell you that um, both of the one roof projects, um, infrastructure costs exceeded budget performance and um, Financial assistance with infrastructure could help um, get some more housing developed. Uh, there are, I can think of two examples right away where we could use these funds perhaps to help. One is um, within the city limits of Grand Marais, there are lots that could be available for development, but the infrastructure doesn't exist, like the water main and the sewer line, the main, you know, city infrastructure. So a good conversation with the city of Grand Marais, if they have any way of determining cost estimates to extend those big pipes under the ground up in those neighborhoods. Um, another example, a program that we used to offer when I was at IRRRB, provided $25,000 per unit of single family home towards the cost of infrastructure and construction. So that could be very helpful to individual people that are looking to buy a place or build, you know, buy a lot and build a, ho a home. Mm -hmm. um, I just did the math. If we did $25,000 per unit for 16 apartment units, that would take a quarter of this money that we have available. So that, or, or no, almost half. So like for, for rental units, maybe a developer could be offered $10,000 per apartment unit to help with the cost of infrastructure. Um, so some sort of a hybrid blend of those kinds of ideas, I think, would be um, would be very helpful. And um, I also would wonder, James, if we might, if we if we implement the HRA that we're discussing and create the community housing land trust, if we could invest some of these dollars in that trust fund, because we have to have local money in a pot somewhere in order to leverage some of the other state and federal resources that we're hoping to attract. Right. So I guess those are three things. 
<laughs> major infrastructure in the city, grant programs to people that want to build homes and apartments, and then can we use this to lever other money? Yeah, and I think on the last question, Mary, um, I think the answer is no. Generally, you can't, at least not for federal funds, you can't use federal funds to match, to match to meet the yeah. requirement for, for other federal funds. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Yes, Jim. In the uh, just if, if I could add one more thing to Mary's list of questions, um, I, I keep losing track of where um, water and sewer on the West End are, but there's been some investment in infrastructure there, but I think it's not complete, um, right? If I'm, I would love to know what it would take to bring those services online there so that there might be more housing developed there as well as in Grand Marais. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jim, are you talking about in the west end of the county as opposed to the city? Yeah, west end of the county. Uh, again, Mary, am I, you know, my senior mind can't keep it all together, but there, I can recall the disagreements between Tofty and Lutzen about whether Tofty was going to join and whether they were going to build this piece or that piece. And um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not clear what's there and what needs to happen in order to make it a viable system. That's all. Yeah. So that sanitary sewer district that was proposed for Tofty and Schroeder, nothing has been built to my knowledge. And I believe that the um, organization that was created has disbanded. At least one of the townships has dropped out. I can't remember which one, but I, I don't think that's a thing at all. Everybody in the West End is on their own independent wells and septic systems. Yeah, Schroeder backed out of that agreement, and there was some money in a pot, a hundred thousand maybe or something, that maybe is still sitting there. But yeah, that that vision is currently disbanded. Mm -hmm. Kate, I saw your hand was up. Yeah, I don't want to take things uh, in a different direction and housing, of course, is worthy, but I just want to speak from the clinic point of view uh, to some of the healthcare uh, infrastructure that I think is important to keep funded. Um, I work with Allison and Grace on pretty much a daily basis and the clinic uh, and the county uh, public health and human services, we, we really work very closely together um, to make sure that we have a uh, functional public health and uh, primary care system as well as um, crisis management. And so I know that both uh, Grace and Allison have uh, some plans that I would like to uh, throw my weight behind to make sure that we have public health continue to be funded as we saw uh, in the past year. Uh, public health in the state and in the country has been critically underfunded for years, which came back uh, to bite us in a big way. Um, and uh, not to say that Grace didn't do an amazing job with her department of one, but we could really use a little bit more oomph in that area. Um, and then particularly in the area of mental health, behavioral health, I know Alice and I have been talking a lot about just the really deep needs in our county um, for everything that we can do to make sure that we have a strong uh, and functional behavioral health and mental health system. The clinic, we try to do our part, our focus is on primary and preventative care. And there are a lot of things that we rely on the county for to make sure that we have that strong connection that gives everybody what they need, whether they're in crisis or whether they're seeking preventative care. And I would strongly encourage uh, us to look at those needs as well. Those are really important points. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I saw Dan first, and then we'll go to Allison. Um, so I'm wearing my school board hat right now. It's not what blue. It doesn't say Vikings, but that's that's what I'm doing um, for ISD 166. Uh, anyways, so um, there's obviously a lot of money that is being injected across the country to different sectors for different things. You know, this is one of them, you know, the schools are getting um, different types of funding to help fill some of these gaps. It's called ESSER funding and that's being used. 
um, and is helpful. You know, the school has certainly lost revenue as a result of enrollment dipping. Um, you have lost revenue, um, compensatory revenue from the feds for uh, a dip in free and reduced lunch um, enrollment. And then we've also just, you know, had higher costs to distribute materials and just the way that we've had to operate. Um, but some of that, I wouldn't say that we're in like a bad financial situation due to the um, in the injection of, a, of the other money. Um, but what I, but sort of in light of that, I mean, I guess what's really important to me are like issues of equity. And I think, you know, this is a million bucks. It's not like the most money in the world. You know, you could give a hundred thousand to each of the organizations being represented here and it would be helpful, but it wouldn't, you know, I think what would be really great is if we could focus this money in a way that um, is addressing issues that aren't being addressed, maybe from other pots of money right now, um, in particular, helping um, raise up the people that, you know, have historically been left behind. So, you know, the broadband infrastructure issue is really big when we think about um, issues of equity and also school. Um, the, the, us continuing to be more online is definitely going to be a thing, um, especially in a rural county like this. Like, I just can't imagine that we won't have a continued online component, whether that's just wet, bad weather days or, you know, flexibility reasons. So I think that's a big piece to making sure that that can work. And then just also access to the devices um, and those sorts of things to make sure that everybody can participate. Um, in that. So those are kind of the big ones for me. And then as far as, you know, the, I would just also like to give a shout out to, um, you know, we had a lot of frontline workers that probably went underpaid. So I know that was listed, but like the paraprofessionals and like bus drivers and stuff, you know, kind of like stepped up in those times. So um, that would, would be something I would advocate for too. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. Allison, I think you were next. I had a question. Um, I'm just curious, James, you mentioned that the tribal government is receiving direct allocation, mm -hmm. uh, which makes a lot of sense, but do we have an idea about what's happening at a state level with other types of uh, community organizations that may receive funds once the state budget is finalized? I mean, this is certainly a factor for us in public health as we propose our request to maintain staffing levels is that we don't know what's going to happen with local public health dollars at a state level. We have some ideas, but until that budget is finalized, we mm. won't know if it'll have a significant or meaningful impact on our ability to keep the staff on. Um, mm. So can this be a part of our discussion and looking at where those areas of greatest need are in our community? What might come up once the state budget is finalized in terms of allocations to schools and healthcare and and other community partners that are a part of that ecosystem of supporting people that intersects with us in our work in public health and human services. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I, I don't know the answer to that offhand, of course. Um, um, and I see Jen Sorensen had to, to leave us. Um, and both, I invited both both her and uh, Chairman Deshaw um, so, you know, their, their participation in this discussion and the, the question of how, um, how we allocate these resources, if, if they can be a benefit, I, I tend to agree with Dan and, and John, you know, we, we need to be thinking about folks who have been left behind um, in trying to address equity issues in our, in our county, I think is really important. Um, but in terms of your question, Allison, and how state budget issues are going to impact or inform the uh, decisions we make about how to use these dollars. I, that hasn't come into focus for me yet. It, it came up in our, our work with the CARES Act grants last year as we were subgranting uh, support out to childcare and, and other community partners that there was this rapid <laughs> information coming out about you know who is receiving funds and are we going to apply for this through the county or through other sources. So I can just see that being an ongoing. Mm -hmm, certainly. Jim? Uh, just a quick question um, to you, James. It's generally not considered wise to use one-time money to fund ongoing programs. 
because mm -hmm. there's no guarantee that the money will be there the second or third or fourth year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are you applying that here, or how should we think about that? Because this is one-time money. It is. <clears throat> it is, and and that's a, a really good point. Um, you know, it's a consideration. I mean, I, I, I don't know how. I mean, I can't say conclusively. Well, we, we are going to use the dollars for, <laughs> for things that might not continue beyond the term of this grant. Um, but I see the risk in doing that, and uh, wouldn't necessarily want to put us in that position. I would yeah. point out that ARPA dollars do have a kind of a longer uh, lifespan than a lot of other grants. So I think until 2026 for counties. So that's mm -hmm. something significant that um, I think about when we're looking at that grant too. Yeah. I mean, I, I would really like to see us wherever possible, use these funds to, you know, leverage ongoing resources. Um, I don't want to see the, the work that we do with, with ARPA dollars go away after, after the funds are gone. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that we can be um, getting, say, the Board of County Commissioners and other entities to maybe make some commitments to continue work beyond the term of the, uh, the federal dollars, um, I, I would certainly want to try to do that. Other questions or thoughts? Grace. I can speak a little bit to um, kind of the vision for, for public health moving into this next phase of pandemic. Um, so we did put a, a proposal to hire a public health educator that would maintain the capacity that we've had through our temp staff. And um, as we put that proposal together, really, I kind of think about the disaster life cycle and what emergency preparedness will look like for public health moving into this new phase of the pandemic. So you look at response, recovery, resilience, and preparedness is kind of a cycle with any disaster. And so the broader vision for public health is to have three people cross-trained in, emerg in emergency preparedness and response so that we can scale up or down response efforts for COVID or any other public health emergency that might come so that we're able to very quickly scale and move into different phases of that response. So that's the portion of um, kind of public health that will continue to be very COVID focused, even as we have fewer cases and less volume of vaccination going on is really documenting what we did, what worked well, what we could do better in the future, uh, and making sure we're continuing to work with the state and federal government to ensure that we have that baseline preparedness capability in our department. So that's kind of the, the vision of, of ongoing public health emergency response, just to be flexible, responsive, and able to scale accordingly in very short notice. Um, and the other portion is really looking at some of the other effects that might have come out of the pandemic. I mean, we've talked, we've been so laser focused on infectious disease control, um, but we also have to look back at our community health assessment and see what was the impact on some of the pre existing needs that were in the community of a year plus living with COVID. So, some of the things like mental health, substance use disorder, um, housing was on that list, aging in the community, supporting young families what accessing specialty care, what happened with all of those priorities after we had to turn our gaze away from some of those and focus so much on infectious disease control this past year. So aside from the kind of emergency life cycle and our role in that, we're also gonna need to turn our gaze back to some of the other priorities in the community that we haven't been able to work on with the same uh, intention that we would have in an, any other year. So that's kind of what, what my general sense is for, for public health. And it would be wonderful if American Rescue Plan dollars could, could be used to support a portion of that. These are all great ideas. So I'm certainly, um, you know, I love hearing the perspective that all of you bring to the table. And I certainly don't want it to be the exclusive focus of these funds. But I do think that there is going to be an ongoing uh, responsibility for public health that 
I think um, in my position, I look at a little bit differently coming out of the pandemic and knowing what it means to be prepared. I'm not going to think about that the same way ever again after having to dive into the COVID uh, era the way that we did back in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. I'll also kind of shifting gears a little bit, but focusing on um, one of the health assessment priorities and just witnessing um, one of the essential worker categories that I saw called out in that um, document you shared um, was childcare and knowing that we've had an incredibly stressful year for our childcare partners. That was something that we focused on with CARES Act funding, but I think as we look at economic recovery more holistically, the role of childcare is unique and has been stressed in the community because of the pandemic as well, with providers having to limit the number of children they were able to accept and really op operationalize things very differently for infection control purposes that I know that's been a stressor for our local childcare system this past year. <clears throat> Thank you, Grace. You've covered a lot of ground there, and, and I agree. I mean, refocusing on our community health improvement plan and figuring out what, what have we had to kind of back burner in the last 18 months, um, refocusing on those issues. And, and child care is a huge issue. And, and I'm wondering, you know, even like expanding child care capacity in the county, um, you know, maybe by using dollars to provide training to people who maybe want to um, get into that, that field um, to, to provide those needs. I know that I, I don't have a uh, school age or a preschool child, but I know that there, there's a real um, shortage of that kind of, that kind of service. Pat. You know, James, I resonated with your fact that I don't think uh, this money should be directed toward the business community as a whole, but I did like the discussion I just heard about childcare. It's very yeah. different, difficult for childcare workers to make a profit in this county doing their work. And we did lose one childcare um, business uh, in the past few months. So childcare is going to raise to the top along with the whole issue of uh, finding employees and keeping employees. Um, so I also resonated with what Dan Shirley was saying. I'd like to see these monies drop down into the hands of the people who have really kept us at this state where we're at. Um, essential workers, I was heartened to see in that document that perhaps some kind of funding for essential workers who went over and above, including, you know, the grocery store workers who brought my groceries out every single week was, it was just amazing to see what happened in this community. So seeing if there's a way to develop a plan to um, uh, intent and also recognize, I think there's a lot of recognition that needs to be done around the community for everyone who works so hard and every, every person on this call who's done, has done something over and above. So the recognition angle, if there's a way to think about that going forward is something that I, I really resonate as well. And housing's near and dear to my heart as well. Um, I think Mary and Jim came up with some interesting ideas there's been an idea floating around that maybe we need a revolving loan fund that's just for housing. So if there's a developer who has just a final gap, just one more pot of money he needs to make, he or she needs to make the leap, we've got something to offer them because our current revolving loan fund can't do that. That's another idea that's been floating around. So I'll add to the fact that there's a lot of good ideas here and not enough money. Mm -hmm. Always. Thanks, Pat. Other thoughts, particularly from folks who haven't uh, spoken yet, uh, Carmen or Sheriff Eliason, any any thoughts about these uh, grant funds? Um, well, like 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 Pat just said, you know, we have a lot of money. I mean, not a lot of money, but we have a lot of needs, and uh, all of the needs that that people have spoken about so far are are needs that that are very important um i guess i would i would advocate for the broadband simply on the on a public safety um relevance because we experience a ton of phone outages through century tell century link and if everybody had an opportunity to be um hooked up to broadband and and use that telephone service 
our 911 <coughs> system, <coughs> excuse me, would be would be much stronger. And in the past, unfortunately, CenturyLink has made the statement that we do not have enough customers in this area for them to do any more than what they're doing right now, which is, in my opinion, very poor service. Um, we we have weekly and almost daily 911 outages in Cook County due to the infrastructure from from CenturyLink. So, um, I guess, like I said, in a in a in the public safety relevance, you know, broadband would be um, close to my heart, and and also housing because, uh, as everybody knows, um, we we have a very difficult time <clears throat> attracting any new deputies due to the housing. Um, the last time we had, well, we still have a, we have a current opening right now. And we've had it for almost a year now because we have not had an applicant due to the uh, unavail unavailability of, of any housing in Cook County. So, you know, those, those two are, are important to me, but, you know, mm -hmm. listening to everybody else, it's, uh, it's hard, it's hard for me to say that, that this is the most important because all of these needs are very important to Cook County. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Other thoughts? I think we've heard from most folks. Go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say so, uh, a little bit more about the, the child care and like early childhood um, mm -hmm. piece. Um, so many of these things are interconnected, right? Um, and uh, the were issues, but the pandemic has certainly highlighted them more. But um, there's a lot of stuff actually happening on the early childhood front um, in Cook County. There's um, some, there's a basically a collaboration amongst a, a few different entities, including the school and the clinic and and others on getting a community hub going for early childhood. And of course, you know, there's so much strong data that suggests that uh, strong early childhood education, you know, it's a, there's a high return on that investment in terms of, um, you know, people's quality of life, their just capacity within their lives and how they operate within the communities they live in. Um, so that's, that's a big deal. And there's a big opportunity here to help that project along, I think as well. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, with the new superintendent coming in at the school, that's going to help really supercharge the, the school's participation in that. Um, but, you know, the, the whole concept of intertwining that with that with more robust, reliable, predictable child care, I think is another big opportunity. And, you know, I've mentioned this before, like I, it would be really neat if we could create, you know, maybe some sort of collaborative, like across some of the bigger employers in the county, you know, the school, the county, the clinic, hospital, you know, could we create some sort of like in-house, like childcare program, you know, if we could build a facility or something and hire some people that could provide childcare to people that work at these entities, which is a big proportion of, of people that have jobs in the county. Um, and then do some like interesting collaborations, you know, with like the care center and that sort of thing. There's just, I think, uh, maybe an opportunity to do some interesting things that way. Um, that maybe money like this could help, you know, it's, it, it would be an ongoing cost, you know, kind of to Jim's point, but sometimes, um, you just need a little bit of seed money to get something going. Um, and then it can, you know, be sustained in other ways. In, in the future. So that, that's just another idea that I've, I've been kicking around and, you know, maybe, maybe something like this would be helpful to get something like that off the ground. Um, mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I saw Pat's hand up next. And I'll only take a minute, but what's exciting to me about this conversation is that by the time this conversation and the Friday conversation is done, we should have a pretty good list of what the gaps are from every organization. And as we look at it as a team, I think it's going to help us figure out how to better partner together to get some of these things taken care of, even though we won't have enough money right now. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking this is going to give us a really nice roadmap for some of our future needs. So I'm kind of excited by that. So I didn't have anything other than that to add. Thanks, Pat. <clears throat> Jim, I saw your hand up next. 
To the extent that the decision is to invest in things like Dan has talked about, or Grace has talked about, or Kate, um, that, that do imply ongoing costs, I think that it will be really critical that the county board be involved and an existing county board can never encumber a future county board. That's understood. But um, it would be really important that we have some indication from the county board that the things that we're considering investing this money in are things they agree with and would be open to supporting in future years so that we're, so that we're in sync with them if we're going to in, in, invest not in infrastructure, for example, not in the, in the daycare infrastructure, child care infrastructure, but in child care service, which is ongoing. Um, we, we need the county board to say, God bless you, you're headed in the right direction, and we're with you on this. Yeah. <clears throat> and so just to speak a little bit to how, how that process is going to work. So um, after the Friday meeting, um, what I'm hoping to do um, for example, at the beginning of this conversation, John, you talked about the need for, for broadband service, particularly to low income uh, households. And so, you know, what I'd like to do is maybe start getting um, some sort of mini proposals from folks on this call um, about how they would like to see these dollars spent so that we can start compiling a record of um, possible uses of the dollars and take that to the board. Um, <clears throat> you know, what, what, what I want to do, I mean, the, the board's going to have to approve the overall budget for, for the use of the ARP dollars. And so after these first two meetings, I think there's going to need to be a process of evaluation assessment and figuring out where um, where there seems to be the greatest community support for for these various um, for these various areas of expenditure that we're talking about, and and then get some kind of consensus uh, from from all of our stakeholders about what what represents the best and highest use of the dollars before we take a budget to the board, and so. And, and there might even, uh, I've been asked if there would be some kind of steering committee overseeing the um, budgeting and expenditure of these dollars. I think there's value in considering that. Um, I, think that I think how that looks ultimately depends on um, how we decide to, to spend the dollars. Um, but I, I, there's gonna be a lot more conversation. These, these meetings that we're having this week are just the first step. Um, but I would like to, within the next, say, you know, six to eight weeks, be able to say, based on all the input we've gotten from the community, here's what we think the budget uh, should look like, um, get feedback from the board, there might even be like a committee of the whole meeting, uh, at which we could get additional feedback uh, before finalizing a budget that we would take to the board for approval. Mary. Thank you. I want to um, add a little bit to what Dan was talking about, some of the larger employers perhaps collaborating on a child care center. Um, Kimber's not here, and I'm not speaking for her, but I'm going to quote her. <laughs> she has stated in a couple of different meetings that we should consider whether there are some of those employers who would be willing to make commitments to renting units in a, in a um, apartment complex or a housing complex of some nature. So maybe that's kind of a, <clears throat> um, could be like a, a, a double focused initiative where someone could, put together this concept and invite the hospital and the clinic and the county and whoever else to commit to participation at some level of uh, renting units of housing and on the ground floor of this housing complex or some corner or side of the building is the also joint collaborative childcare for the kids who live there and 
however many other kids could be accommodated in such a space. Mm -hmm. We did have a, at one time we had a developer, um, the first developer that I worked with about an assisted living facility was proposing such a thing on the site of the property would be the assisted living facility, workforce housing for the people who were gonna work in the facility and a childcare center for their families. Mm -hmm. So the more I think we can, because our community is so small, the more we can blend our needs in common solutions, the farther ahead we're going to get with actually seeing something happen. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. I like it. <clears throat> Other thoughts? So we, we are having the second meeting on Friday. Um, you are all welcome to, to participate in that if you would like. Um, the format of it will be the same as today's conversation. Um, and, and I would ask uh, for you all to, to think about um, if, if you could just send me, like using your idea, John, as an example, that that to me looks like a discrete sort of mini proposal. Um, Kate, you talked about the importance of spending on, on public health and health care. Um, it would be it would be useful to get from this group some sense of <clears throat> what a project might be, uh, the scope of it, and a potential budget. Recognizing that you know we we could spend. $150,000 on broadband expansion, expansion, or we could spend the whole million plus on that. Likewise with, with public health and, and primary care. Um, <clears throat> but having some kind of sort of discrete proposal with a price tag attached to it would be really helpful in starting to put together um, a proposal for how to spend the the overall funding. Anybody have any other thoughts about how we could uh, start to, to bring this into focus? Anything that would be useful to consider? Mary. Do you know, James, if anyone from the city is planning to attend the meeting on Friday that might be able to bring a greater understanding of where the big pipes do not exist on the west side of town? So I did invite bo both Mike Roth and I forget who from the uh, Public Utility Commission. To Tom Nelson? Oh, someone from the commission? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, if, if there's anybody else from the city who should be involved in this, uh, I only invited those two. Um, but if Maybe other... reach out to Tom Nelson. He's the, the department head for the public utilities, and he might be able to, in, in your invitation, ask him if he can bring any kind of quantification to what that might look like. Uh -huh. uh, because I, 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 have no, I have no way of understanding. I think the answer is probably like $10 million or something, but... <laughs> You know, if we had X amount of money, how many blocks of pipe could we put in or, right. or how, how could we lever that money to get other money or? <clears throat> I, I think we definitely need to know that. I'm kind of terrified to find out the answer, but uh, yeah, <clears throat> but we need to know. Yeah. Right. Other thoughts? I'm going to send you Tom Nelson's contacts to make it easier mm -hmm. for you. Great. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. Again, this is only the start of the discussion. If after we adjourn today, you have additional ideas um, and want to send those to me, or you could uh, log on to Friday's meeting uh, and, and share them then, that would be great. Um, but I really want this whatever we end up with in terms of a budget proposal for these dollars, I really wanted to reflect the community's uh, needs and desires. 
Um, again, this is not county government's problem to solve. It's, it's our problem as a community to, to work together to, to make sure that we're spending these dollars in the, in the best, most impactful way. Well, I Thank am- you. Thank you, James, for the inclusive process. Oh, absolutely. It's the, in my view, it's the only way to do things. <laughs> So I, and, and it depends on your participation. So thanks for making the time for this today. Thank you. Thank you. You folks have a great day.